these women who came to Oxford seeking the intercession of an Anglo-Saxon saint. What drew them to the shrine? How far did they come? What did they do on arrival? And were their experiences any different from those of men? So these questions would be impossible to answer without prior Phillips and miracles of St. Bride's wife that we've already been induced to do today by Andrew. They record the devotional experiences of visitors to the shrine between the years of about 1180 and 1183. There were other miracles collections compiled in England around this time. The 12th century was especially productive, time for miracle writing, but Philip's collection is outstanding for a number of reasons. First, it features a large number of pilgrims, 135 in total. Second, it includes a great de detail of fascinating detail about pilgrims' experiences. Thirdly, and most importantly for our purposes this afternoon, women feature prominently in the stories. It's no exaggeration to say that the miracles of St. Fry's Wife provide us with one of the most compelling and comprehensive insights into female pilgrimage in medieval England. So my talk today is based on evidence from this rather wonderful text as expertly edited and translated by Andrew here. So I'm very grateful for Andrew, for the work he's done on this manuscript, and the slides you'll see this afternoon follow his own edition, and I should point out that the English translations are his. So, to Fry's White's female pilgrims, who were they? Well, the first thing to say is that 62% of <coughs> shrine visitors recorded by Prior Philip were women or girls. Enough detail is given by Philip to identify the ages and social backgrounds of many of these pilgrims. In terms of age, labels such as Puella and Virgo allow us to categorise female pilgrims according to their different life stages. As you can see, we can identify a broad range of them spanning childhood to old age, although only one pilgrim is characterised as being elderly, the woman poetically described as advanced in her days. <coughs> Children's ages are recorded with more precision. We find that the youngest girls are three and four years old, while the oldest are aged 15 and 17. In terms of women's social background, there's a similarly wide um, range. Some female pilgrims are identified as noble women, others belong to the knightly classes, and a handful of prominent families. On the opposite end of the social scale, a few are said to be poor, and two made their livelihoods from begging. One striking feature about Philip's miracle collections is that we're given the medical histories and social circumstances of many of these women, allowing us to glimpse something of their lives. Many women's stories are troubling, even heartrending, and reveal a darker and often more disturbing side of womanhood in medieval England. Poverty, domestic abuse, mental illness, and social prejudice are just some of the recurring themes in the narrative. We hear, for example, of Viva Broxton, whose illness has so altered her behaviour that she was bound in chains and deserted by her husband, and of Viva of Shoreham, who had buried five children in Oxford and was forced by poverty into mendicancy. Another woman reduced to begging is 17-year-old Matilda of Northampton, blind in both eyes. Mm -hmm. Philip explains that her parents and friends had abandoned her on account of this, and she sought assistance with life by begging. Since she lacked human wealth, she fled to him who makes poor and makes rich, who brings low and lifts up. So this is a quote from the book of Samuel. Some specifically gendered issues come to light with stories which recount women's unhappy relationships with men. Helen of Lugelshaw's medical troubles seem to have begun after she was deserted by the priest with whom she had both been a cohabiting while those of Isabella of Beechhampton are said to have appeared after catching her husband in the act of adultery. One story which particularly stands out is the sad tale of Emmeline of Eddington, a young woman who attempted to drown herself in the River Kennet. 
driven by mental illness to the point where she wished to kill herself, Emily left her home by night and threw herself into the river. The current dragged her under a mill wheel. However, because she thought to say a protective Hail Mary before jumping in, her plight was divinely revealed in the dream to a miller who came to her rescue. Her illness though, continued and she was taken by her mother and brother for a cure at Rye Forehead Shrine. So these then are just some of the female pilgrims prior Philip introduces us to in his miracle narrative. Although these hagiographical accounts had a strong religious and moral slant, we shouldn't doubt that these stories describe very, very, very real case studies and very real people. They therefore throw the rare spotlight onto some of the hardships experienced by the kinds of women whose lives wouldn't, without Philip's text, have come to light and entered the historical record. They also, of course, provide some insight into some of the more extreme reasons why women set out on pilgrimage in this period. Prior Philip's miracle collection features almost exclusively those who undertake pilgrimage for health reasons. With a few exceptions, all the pilgrims arriving at the Augustinian Priory are either on a quest for, he for a healing miracle or on pilgrimage to give thanks for one already granted. Since ill health is the main motivating factor, the information about why women went on pilgrimage is, of course, going to be limited. Other reasons, such as everyday devotion, are mentioned. The best we can do is to ask what kind of illnesses drove women to, to leave their homes, sometimes travelling very, very many miles, in search of healing. In terms of the medical conditions recorded in the text, these actually tell us very little about female-specific pilgrimage. In common with other miracle collections of the period, most ailments suffered by pilgrims conform to a standard hagiographical repertoire. Both men and women are depicted as victims of a variety of, top, uh, of typical ailments such as blindness, fever, swellings, ulcers, mental illness, paralysis, and other physically crippling conditions. The exceptions to this are ailments which might loosely be termed gynecological, such as the pain experienced by Mabel and Shifford after childbirth and the disorder of the womb suffered by Renelda's of Abingdon, which caused her to be, bent, to be bent over. However, since there are relatively few of these, the collection as a whole does little to suggest that women regularly brought such problems to the shrine and reported them to the Canons. More per pertinent to the question of women's motivations is, I think, the fact that all their medical complaints are long-term ones, which, as a narrative stress, these women have struggled with for some time, and usually for many years. We hear, for example, of a Zula of Pilata, paralysed down one side of her body for 10 of her 18 years, of Agnes of Sarsden, with kidney pain for 8 years, and of Godiva of Lutz Hill, stricken with a 10-year headache. One of the longest female sufferers is Prithida of Haverhill, who lived, with seven, who lived with severely restricted vision for nearly 20 years. Some of these stories emphasize the severity of the illness. A lady with a 10-year-old headache, for example, didn't just complain of a headache. Prior Felix explains that, the sharpness of the disease often troubled her so much that with her soul dismayed, her senses abandoned her, and all the strength and vigour of her limbs died down. The brutality of her pain spread further, so that the lower parts of her body were paralysed for a long time, and she was robbed of the ability to stand or walk. The strength of her shins and feet came numb, so that she could by no means tread on the ground, except with the help of a staff offered to her. What particularly stands out in these stories is the number of times Philip emphasises the long duration of women's suffering, and especially in comparison to men's. Out of the 38 references to uh, years of long suffering, 31 are found in women's stories, so that's 82%. There is, however, 
theoretical reason for Philip highlighting the retractive plight of women and men stricken with ill health. The more seemingly intractable the condition, the more kudos is given to the healing powers of the saint. Why the theme that occurs in more women's stories than in men's may also be due to a hagiographical trope. Women are frequently valorized for their endurance and fortitude in miracle narratives, as we'll see later. Nonetheless, we shouldn't dismiss this suffering motif as mere fiction. Like most of the detailed information in the narratives, it derives from questions put directly to witnesses. The length of the time waited by women for initiation of pilgrimage may reflect a very real female proclivity towards stoic endurance. For our purposes, however, the motif allows us to delve deeper into the backstories of female pilgrims and get into something of the circumstances which set them on what Prior Philip uh, presents as a life-changing journey. So having heard something about women's reasons for setting out on pilgrimage, let's now turn to their journeys. What does Prior Philip say about women's travel experiences and how do they differ from those of men? First, I should point out that the reality of and attitudes towards female travel in the Middle Ages has been a topic of interest among scholars in recent years. A popular view is that female pilgrims, as medieval women in general, usually kept their journeys short and were less likely than men to travel far from home. For women with domestic and family responsibilities, this is mainly a matter of practicality. However, negative cultural attitudes towards female mobility also played their part, and suspicion was often thrown on the moral integrity of travelling women. The question then is not just about the kinds of distances travelled by women in Philip's collection, but what his stories might tell us about the attitudes towards female travel at a time um, when it was not always looked upon with approval. In one sense, Prior Philip's collection does indeed support the idea that women's travel experiences were narrower than those of men. With respect to general travel patterns, the men depicted in the stories journeyed further than their female counterparts, and their reasons for travel are far more varied. So this is nicely illustrated in two miracles recording the visions of two Oxford citizens. In the first, a male visionary is a long-distance trader returning from a business trip in London, while in the second, the female visionary experiences her vision at home. This male-female away versus home pattern is repeated throughout the collection, where the greatest distances travelled are recorded for men. Examples include three young men sitting out from Jerusalem after their cures, a knight from Brittany visiting friends at Oxford, and three travellers from Winchester on a long journey who stop off at Oxford en route. Santiago de Compostela is also mentioned in a story about a man from Gloucester who, on his way to St James's Shrine, has his purse snatched while visiting St Bride's Wise Priory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but of course it all becomes well okay in the, in the end because of the thief is, is reprehended. Significantly, these kinds of long distance travels are absent in women's stories. Ambitious international pilgrimages, such as those to Jerusalem and Santiago, aren't mentioned for women, and neither are journeys for non religious objectives. Women's journeys are specifically focused on domestic destinations for the sole purpose of healing. Modern scholars have long been fascinated by the distances travelled by medieval pilgrims to a local shrine often using information from miracle collections to plot catchment areas of various cults. So this is an example taken from Simon Yarrow's book, Saints and Their Communities, for the Shrine of St. James and James's Hand at Reading Abbey. As you can see, the cult was clustered fairly closely around Reading. It's generally agreed that pilgrimages to local shrines tend to be no more than a day or two's journey in duration, with a smattering of outliers, as you can see here. And Friesweiss pilgrims neatly conform to this idea, with most coming from locations within a 64-kilometre radius of Oxford. And this is the map, um, thanks to 
to Andre. <laughs> Given the popular assumption that women travelled less far than men, we might expect them to be found relatively close to Oxford. However, what's interesting about Friar Philip's story is that women seem to travel some rather long distances. The 13 begin their journeys more than 80 kilometres away, and of the 16 pilgrims who travelled more than 100 kilometres, half were female. Their homes include Essex, Lincoln, and Exeter. Alice, a woman suffering from painful swellings, lived in Bayton, nearly 300 kilometres away. Of these more intrepid women, there may have been, there, they may have travelled for much longer because we're told that they visited many saint shrines before arriving at St. Francois, and I think Andrew mentioned one of these. Multiple shrine visiting is the popular hagiographical motif, which allows writers <coughs> to suggest that pilgrims were failed by many rival saints before finally selecting the right one, as we talked about earlier. In Philip's collection, the motif is associated in each case with women. Interestingly though, it carries no criticism of the female itinerancy. It only adds to the impression that, when undertaken for religious purposes, female domestic travel was an accepted and perhaps even admired part of medieval culture. How did women travel to Fry's White Shrine in the, in the 12th century? And what kind of transport did they use? But prior Philip mentions three main forms of transport, and Andrew has already mentioned some of these. Um, carriage, wagon, um, and cart, travelling on horseback and walking. The three stories which mention horseback riding suggests that this was the preferred method for wealthier members of society for both men and women. We learn, for example, that it was only because she was too unwell to travel, to sit on a horse, that the 14-year-old daughter of Roger Fitzralph was taken to the shrine in a carriage. As this example suggests, the carts and carriages seem to have been used as a way of conveying the seriously ill. It's striking, however, that all the carriage passengers mentioned by Philip are women. Was this perhaps a specifically female form of travel? Furthermore, it's one which seems only to have been used in times of necessity and perhaps shunned by the physically fit. After her cure, Roger's daughter insisted on reverting to horseback. The story explains, and when her parents asked her to allow them to carry her home in the cart and had carried her, she said, far be it from me that I be led back in the cart. If you wish me to go back, bring me horses, so that, seated on the horse, I may return home joyfully. Further down the social scale, we might expect that walking was fairly standard for more able-bodied pilgrims. However, a problem with Philip's miracle stories is that most don't specify exactly how pilgrims travelled, and it's often all too easy to assume that they, they arrived in Oxford on foot. To take just one example, we learn that Margaret of Shrewsbury was so disabled that she needed to lean on a staff to move around. However, there's no mention of whether she managed to hobble from her home in Shrewsbury, aided by her staff, or whether she found a more comfortable alternative. Some accounts are that more of the religion. One of these concerns Christiana, the, the mother of a boy named William, who was on crutches. Leaving Lincoln, Christiana took her son to many saint shrines before arriving at Oxford. The boy, we're told, was exhausted by the enormity of the grueling journey, and not least because his crutches had worn away holes in his armpits. When we do hear about foot travel, it's usually, as in this story, in the context of pain and suffering. Coming from Lincoln, Christiana evidently walked a very long way. However, Philip's text shows how shorter walks might also result in agonising discomfort. Although not living far from Oxford, Emma Brighton was so seriously stricken with debilitating physical and mental ailments that, according to Friar Philip, the disease of her body 
rendered her steps difficult, and she journeyed for five days before she arrived at her desired destination. And this is an image of another nobility aid that was used in the Middle Ages. It's not actually mentioned in Fried's Wise Miracles, um, but it's mentioned elsewhere. And these are, these are called stools. It's kind of walked along with your hands if you couldn't walk upright. For pilgrims weakened by illness and encumbered by mobility issues, the effort of walking was clearly a struggle. Alongside these practical issues, however, we also find pedestrian travel as a form of penance. This can be seen in cases where pilgrims are determined to go on foot, despite the physical suffering this entails. We're told that Margaret of Collingbourne wanted to walk to Oxford as an acceptable sacrifice to God and the Blessed Virgin. Unfortunately, her medical condition meant that she wasn't enabled to complete her journey on foot as she wished. In a more successful attempt at self-sacrifice and suffering, a blind woman not only walked barefoot from London, but also added fasting to her, to her septic practices. Due to practical issues and cultural prejudices, we might speculate that medieval women rarely travelled alone from pilgrimage. The famous medieval pilgrim, Marjorie Kemp, who you may have heard of, began some of her longer journeys solo, but also understood the physical and moral issues of learned travel and spent some time um, securing suitable companions. Whether the same pressure was on women visiting local shrines is hard to judge, especially for miracle stories, which focus on the protagonist of each story and only infrequently turn the spotlight on two subsidiary characters. 21 stories in the Miracles of Fried's Wife mention sick female pilgrims travelling with companions, usually friends and family. Where these companions are identified, they tend to be family members. Mothers come top of the list, then husbands, brothers and friends. In two cases, women team up with another cure-seeking companion. In one, two blind sisters from Asian travel together. In another, more notable example, an elderly lady shares her journey with a ten-year-old boy from the same village. The old lady is blind, while the boy has mobility problems, and we can imagine the pair providing one another with mutual support. There are far fewer stories featuring healthy women acting as travel companions to the sick. With the exception of a wife accompanying her husband, these female companions are mostly mothers bringing their ailing children to the shrine illustrating, of course, the health, the health care role in the medieval family. Once at Fry's Wild Shrine, what did pilgrims do? In Philip's miracle collection, there's one overwhelming aim of their visit, to request and hopefully receive a miraculous cure. This simple objective, however, often took some time, and the stories reveal that cure-seeking could be a protracted business. One interesting feature about Philip's collection is that pilgrims to Oxford don't simply arrive, obtain a quick cure, and depart. Um, so, as Andrew had said, people are quite often seen sleeping and spending some time at the shrine. Indeed, five pilgrims are said to have spent some time there. Ten slept at the shrine overnight, while three apparently stayed over a week. And the record goes to a young man suffering from fever who waited nearly three weeks for a cure and then remained in the church for another week to guard against relapse. This is closely followed by a female pilgrim who, who lasted almost three weeks. So there are several points to be made here about local pilgrimage in general and women's, and women's partition, uh, participation in particular. First, However contrived some of these stopovers might seem, for example, the suspiciously gospel-like three days stay, <coughs> they must also have reflected a historical reality, whereby many local pilgrimages continued for some time at the destination, often for weeks. The Priory Church at Oxford then, as Andrew has already mentioned, was likely being a temporary home to a few a semi-residence of both sexes, giving pilgrimage something of a communal feel. 
So this can be illustrated, I mean, Andrew has already given one example, but there's another example in which the father of a sick boy is described as providing his services to the sick who were lying everywhere in the church in the course of the night. A second point of interest is the length of the pilgrim stay doesn't appear to be affected by his gender. Both men and women are shown residing in the church for long periods. Nonetheless, there are a couple of stories in which Philip praises the endurance of women who remain in a church where their men folk have given up hope. One of these is the case of Agnes and Don Stew, a blind woman who arrived at the church with her father. Due to the delay in Agnes's healing, her father lost hope and returned home. More resilient, Agnes persisted in her faith and determination, leading Philip to praise her for, counting, for countering the widespread belief in female fickleness. The topos of the weaker sex, finding staying power through faith, is found in other places in Philip's collection and appears elsewhere in the miracle genre. While we might not want to take this gender cliche too literally, these accounts nonetheless demonstrate the positive attitudes taken towards women spending a long time on pilgrimage, and no doubt reflect a little appreciated reality. For many women, pilgrimage must have been a serious, time-consuming commitment, which involved both a long journey and perhaps an extended stay at their destination. Rituals taken to saint shrines in the Middle Ages involved a number of non-liturgical personal rituals believed to facilitate communion with the divine. So Andrew has already mentioned some of these. Um, supplicantary prayers, or prayers of thanksgiving, perhaps the most common, along with tears of contrition and humble prostration before the shrine. Um, these are some that um, Andrew has mentioned, vigil, which is prayer for wakefulness, and Andrew mentioned incubation, which is the practice of sleeping at the shrine. So these are very common and found in all sorts of miracle stories. Philip's collection is a rich source of these and other ritual activities. Some involve devotion, uh, devotional objects and reveal how relationships with the divine were mediated through what were essentially everyday items. Since many of these rituals were undertaken at home, before the pilgrim even set out on his or her journey, they may also provide an interesting insight into popular piety in a domestic setting, an environment where they might perhaps expect women to be particularly active. The Miracles of Fry's Wife mention three practices performed at home as a prelude to a pilgrimage. And I'd like to talk about these in a bit more detail. One of the most common and still prevalent today in Catholic cultures is the pilgrimage vow. So this was a transaction, uh, this was a, had a transactional element and involved a pact with a saint in times of sudden crisis or on occasions when immediate relief is required, a promise to go on pilgrimage is made on the condition that the saint first answers the supplicant's prayer. One example in Philip's collection is the pilgrimage vow made by Agnes, wife of a goldsmith from Leicester, weakened by fever to such an extent that she lost her mind. Her husband took to lodges, and many had returned from Oxford with news of the miracles wrought by Fry's wife. Hearing these reports, Agnes, without delay, rejoiced as though her unhappiness was in remission and bound herself with a vow that she would visit the Virgin's shrine of whose miracles she had heard. In that instance, she recovered completely and set out to fulfil her promise to the saint. In the Middle Ages, this spiritual transaction was sometimes sealed with further rituals. Two of these are mentioned, by, <coughs> mentioned in Philip's collection, bending a penny and measuring a candle to a saint. In the first, <coughs> a penny is richly bent as a sign of a vow and taken to the shrine as an offering. In the second, the, the dimensions of the individual requiring healing 
or sometimes his or her limb, or whatever um, uh, is ailing them. Um, so these are measured against a candle wick, and either the wick or the candle containing the wick is brought to the shrine. In this example, we see um, Geoffrey Padley from Oxford using a candle ritual on his four-year-old daughter, suffering with a swollen neck. The father, we're told, measured his daughter with a wick and molded wax on the wick. He offered his candle at the shrine of the Blessed Virgin. While pilgrimage vows are made by both men and women in the collection, there's an interesting gender discrepancy concerning coin bedding and candle measuring. Where the actor is known, all but one are men. Despite their domestic element, the story suggests that these homemade rituals were not as specially seen as a woman's province. Once taken to the shrine, coins and candles were left as offerings, sealing the contract made between the supplicant and the saint. Leaving a gift for the saint was an important element of medieval pilgrimage, and not least for the religious institutions, which benefited from the occasional monetary largesse of wealthy donors. Late medieval inventories record some extravagant donations left by saints devotees, such as the 170 silver ships, 129 silver images, and 450 gold rings, recorded in 1307 for St. Thomas of Canterbury Shrine in Hereford. So the miracles of Fry's wife, though, reveal nothing on this scale in Oxford, nor do they mention another kind of ex-voto offering, wax models and body parts, such as this firm being offered at the shrine of St. William of York. And there are actually some sort of modern examples as well, I right? don't have any images of that, so this still goes on. <laughs> Apart from the ubiquitous coins or candles left by visitors, the only other type of donations appearing in the narratives are two discarded nobility aids, namely a pair of crutches and a walking stick, donated respectively by a boy and a woman as proof of their odorous healing. And this is a modern example from Canada. <laughs> The healing rituals, which appear most frequently in the collection, involve something rather different. Holy water. Mentioned in 18 of the stories, holy water functions as a catalyst for healing, both at and away from Fry's Wise Shrine, and was clearly intended to imitate the famous Canterbury water, which Andrew has been talking about, available at Canterbury Cathedral in the same period. So, as Andrew has already said, Canterbury water was ordinary water diluted with Thomas Beckett's blood, collected after his martyrdom, and it would have been carried away in small flasks, similar to this. The holy water at Oxford, however, was likely being simply water blessed by a priest, and seems to have been freely available to pilgrims visiting the church. The stories show it being applied to the body as a kind of ointment or congested as a drink. On seven occasions, it's depicted as acting as an emetic, purging the body of excess humours through vomiting or sweating. One example features Agnes of Southampton, so swollen with dropsy that her clothes barely fitted her. The story explains she was brought to the church of the Holy Virgin, where she drank holy water, after which she vomited up the harmful humours from her upper body. The swelling subsided and the pain settled down. Blessing God, she returned home with joy, healthy and unharmed. While the use of holy water as a cure is not gender specific in Philip's collection, there's an interesting story in which a woman uses it to cure her family. So, this is the account of a noble woman who took a flask of the water home and hung it over her bed in case she was ever in need. Cure. It came when, becoming seriously ill, she did indeed find use for the water. And the story continues. Given her great pain, she was believed to be a near death. She lifted up her eyes and ordered for the small flask she had carried to be given to her, so that she might test in herself the potency of what she had obtained for the preservation of her own health. Accordingly, 
She poured out what she thought was water from the vessel. She instead found milk, which filled the house with a sweetness of an incalculably precious scent beyond the nature of the milk. At the recommendation of a priest, Margaret moved the flask, with its miraculous contents, to her private chapel for future use for her and her family. <coughs> so there's another rather different story of holy water in Philip's collection. We're told how Bertina, from Northampton, deaf in her right ear, had arrived at Brideswide Shrine hoping for a cure. To her surprise, she was directed by bystanders to another place of healing, a well a mile outside the city, which God had provided for Brideswide. Can you guess where this is, anybody? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the story explains what happens next. After after walking to the well, she filled her ears with water, a ringing in her ears and a tribulation, and a tribulation of itching immediately followed. She, measured, she, she inserted a stalk into her ear and drew out a small portion of flesh. She had received the gift of healing perfectly. She returned to the church, blessing God, and showed, and showed all who were present that she was cured. So oddly, this is the only reference to St. Margaret's well at Binsey. Mm -hmm. So, to recap then. The main cure-seeking rituals in the collection involved vigils, intubation, vows, penny bending, candle measuring, ex voto offerings, and holy water. Modern commentaries on female pilgrimage often view these kind of rituals as practiced especially by women. However, as I've shown, such ritual behaviours don't appear to have a particular gender bias in Philip's stories. There is, though, one exception, the creation of domestic ritual objects, and penny in the measured way, which in the stories are more likely to be associated with men. <laughs> in the miracle genre, the climax of each story is the miraculous cure. The moment when all come by for the pilgrim. For, day, for today's readers, miracles are often the least credible part of the narrative, leading some historians to theorize modern rational explanations for these seemingly medically unlikely events. However, although Prior Philip does relate some of the startlingly abrupt cures in his miracle collection, there are many descriptions of pilgrims whose illnesses take a more convincing trajectory. Perhaps most compellingly, many cures aren't always instantaneous, but are gradually achieved over time. As we've already seen, many female pilgrims wait in the church for days or weeks before a cure is forthcoming. One of these is Halice of Farringdon, whose delayed cure from blindness prompted Philip to comment that God does not immediately provide bodily health to one who asks for it. Some women required more than one visit to the shrine, and relapses are also common, are also recorded. Emma Wheatley, for example, thought that she was cured of her swelling ailment, but found she needed a second visit and her condition returned in the journey home. Other women left the shrine before they were fully cured. How Alice of Shifford was much improved after an eight-day stay at the church, but it was only after returning home and the repeated use of the canon's holy water that she made a full recovery. Partial cures are also recorded. Agnes of Duns Tew was healed of blindness in one eye, but not the other, while Emma of Exeter wasn't entirely freed of dropsy, so the traces of swelling remained on her shins and feet. So Prior Philip is careful to justify these delayed or partial cures. Delayed cures, he claimed, demonstrated the importance of perseverance and faith, while partial cures, which he admitted were a common phenomena, leave imprints of disease on the body to remind people of divine beneficence. In one story, he tells readers that, trace, uh, that traces of pilgrims' former illnesses often remain, so that they would always know to be conscious of the assistance of divine mercy. Relapses, fluctuating symptoms, gradual improvements and imperfect cures are, of course, 
normal scenarios in cases of chronic illness, both today and in the past. Such stories seem to reflect a credible reality and leave modern readers with the feeling that they've glimpsed something of these women's lived experiences on their health-seeking journeys to St. Bride's Wine Shrine. So, in conclusion then, the miracles of St. Fried's Wide tell us much about historical realities of female pilgrimage in the 12th century. Philip's stories, mostly sourced from first-hand witnesses, capture many aspects of local pilgrimage as experienced by women of all ages and from different social backgrounds. We hear about their motivations, about the length of their journeys, about their methods of travel, about their ritual practices at home and at the shrine. Some, some ex expectations about medieval women are reinforced in Philip's collection. <coughs> These include women's propensity to travel with their father men, and mothers' responsibility for their children's health. Other anticipated gender stereotypes, however, are not so easily validated. We discover, for example, that some domestic healing rituals are rarely carried out by women, that few women are recorded seeking cures for gynecological complaints, and that Fried's wives' female devotees are not shunned for journeying long distances for a cure. In other respects, however, Philip's collection alludes to remarkably few gender differences in 12th century pilgrimage practices. Once at the shrine, for example, both men and women offer petitionary prayers, undertake vigils, lead ex voto offerings, and put their faith in holy water for cure. One key aspect of Philip's stories is that female pilgrimage, so often denounced and disparaged in other, in other medieval sources, is praised and applauded. Wandering from shrine to shrine, cross-country travel, and long periods away from home are clearly not envisaged as problematic. Nonetheless, there is a caveat here because Philip is also keen to point out that women, like men, need to demonstrate their faith and pious intentions in order to win Fried's wife's favour. Indeed, one sinful woman, who had embarked on pilgrimage in order to have sexual relations with a man, more or less, was shown to be mysteriously perverted, uh, sorry, prevented from entering the church. <laughs> Freudian slip there. <laughs> I'm glad we're all awake though. <laughs> yeah, she was prevented from entering the church. <laughs> her journey was only allowed to continue once she had made her confession to a priest, shown due contrition and being absolved from her sins. Conditions for pilgrimage recommended by the medieval church. For Philip, pilgrimage should be entered into with a correct spirit and only by those unfettered by sin. Despite Philip's moralising undercurrents and his evident intention to promote best practice for female pilgrims, the historical women in his narratives rise to the surface with convincing authenticity in a way rarely seen in hagiographical texts of the time. Perhaps the most striking aspect of Philip's miracle collection for modern readers is the often heartrending stories of women caught up by misfortune in situations so dire that they leave an a lasting impression on audiences even in the present day. Although no pilgrims were recorded coming from Italy, they were surely there among the locals who trekked across fields and paths over the water meadows to visit St. Bride's Wide on their feast day. And the meadow I wrinkled away that I took when I walked here today. <coughs> among those who, like Retiever of Northampton, found their way to St. Margaret's Well at Bimsey to seek a cure from uh, water blessed by Frideswide. Miracle collections fail to capture all women's pilgrimage experiences, only those with exceptional stories to tell. So women continued to visit Frideswide Shrine for the rest of the Middle Ages. One of the last to do so was Catherine of Aragon, wife of Henry VIII, who in 1511 came to pray for a male heir. As we know, her petition was unsuccessful, leading eventually to the Reformation and to the end of pilgrimages to Fried's Wine Shrine. But there is, of course, 
the postscriptum story of Pippa in Oxford. Surprise White Shrine is again being visited by pilgrims, and the cathedral clergy at Christchurch have once more begun to celebrate her feast day on the 19th of October. <coughs> more excitingly, here we come to Fry's Wise Way. Um, next month seems the launch of, of the St. Fry's Wise Way. Part of the Camino Angles network, stretching from Finkel in the north to Southampton in the south, which should see more pilgrim traffic passing through Oxford. With the days for more pilgrims, I will be searching for cures and miracles from Oxford's ancient faith remains to be seen. But I'd like to end with a bit of promotion as Andrew began his um, by reminding you of the one day conference. Um, the Christchurch Cathedral, which is going to launch a surprise wise way on the 25th of June. So Andrew is going to be our keynote speaker, which we're really excited about. And talks will be also given by Guy Hayward, the British Pilgrimage Trust, and by William Griffiths in the Confraternity of St. James. And there'll be other pilgrimage experts there um, from the Anglican Church and from the academic world. And we'll be talking about pilgrim in pilgrimage today and in the past and in the future. So please make a note of this. Um, the programme is on the event Bright page, so do have a look at it. Um, we'd love to see you there, and we will also love to see you on the inaugural walk, if you can make it, on the days after the 25th. So that's me done. Thank you very much.